Uh, we've got the tensions that we see between the U.S. and China, between Russia, Ukraine, the war in Ukraine. We have other tensions. Um, between different uh, world uh, power centers, even tensions between developing and developed countries, south and north, uh, to some extent. But I, I think the, the biggest source of tensions is the tensions between U.S. and China. And I, I do think that these geopolitical tensions have an impact on uh, uh, the, the shaping of trade. Um, so uh, the, what has happened during the pandemic and the war in Ukraine that exposed vulnerabilities in global supply chains and the heightened tensions that we see have led people to question whether the patterns of trade we have today, whether globalization itself uh, is the way to go. And um, there is, the tensions are leading to a conscious effort to reshore, to friendshore, uh, to change the way that supply chains are currently configured. As of now, the figures on trade do not yet show evidence of the geopolitical tensions having great impact. We still have a tremendous amount of trade uh, between the U.S. and China, over 690 billion um, uh, figures released by the Commerce Department for last year. Between EU and China, over 800 billion. Total world trade at 31 trillion. So we don't yet see the impact. However, this trade is based on past investment patterns. And what may happen is that with these tensions, we may shift, see a shift in investment patterns. Um, shifting investment in certain sectors like technology, high technology uh, end products, semiconductors and so on. And that may change the way that trade in certain sectors is configured. Rare earths and minerals, semiconductors, other types of products. So that's one thing we need to watch out for. We are seeing some, in recent trade data, few glimpses of this, but we need to watch out for that. We certainly do not want fragmentation arising from this because that would be very costly to the world. So it's something we need to watch. That's the first. The second is digitalization. I think that digital trade is the future. Uh, digital, digitally delivered services trade is the fastest growing segment of trade now, growing at 8% per year and faster than uh, growth in goods trade or even services trade. I think we are going to see continued growth in this sector. It's worth about $4 trillion now out of $31 trillion in total trade. That's one thing shaping and we should support and back that because it does help MSMEs and women. I think the third thing very, very quickly is climate change. Climate change, we think, is going to shift comparative and competitive advantages, and that will change the patterns of trade. We're the fifth largest export hub in the world. And uh, in terms of the quick numbers when it comes to the re-exports, 27% of our uh, foreign trade numbers in the first half of this year is re-exports, which, uh, which is around uh, the overall uh, amount of our uh, foreign trade exceeded $300 billion. Because of our re-export capabilities, we became the world's leading re-export of rice. We don't produce rice. We're the third largest re-exporter of diamond. We're the third largest exporter of gold. We're the fourth largest exporter of coffee. And our tea goes and reach 154 nations around the world, and we don't produce tea whatsoever. And it shows how critical the global trade hubs in the, in the UAE and how we are becoming a real player on that. Let me switch quickly on, on what, how we're becoming and how we're seeing the, the, the walls and how we're going to move forward when it comes to the trade hub. The world is becoming more fragmented, as has Her Excellency Dr. Ngozi mentioned, but we're, we're going the opposite. We're signing more free trade agreements. We signed in the last year and a half five uh, comprehensive economic partnership agreements with India, Turkey, Indonesia, Israel, and Cambodia. We're signing one very soon with Georgia, and we're going to, uh, to conclude another six before the end of the year. Shows that the free trade agreements are going to be one of the main uh, tools and factors to ensure that we continue in our leadership when it comes to the global uh, trade. If we understand that two thirds of all global jobs are by MSMEs, one. Two thirds of, or 70% of the global GDP is also due to SMEs. 
then to leave them out of the conversation is probably one of the worst things that can happen. And so we have to find a way to raise their voice, to bring them into the conversation and to give them a seat at the table. Because if we do not do that, we then continue a process where we're operating in silos and we don't have all the voices at the table. One of the major needs for the SMEs is this. At the end of the day, they know that they need to make this transition. They understand very clearly. What they need is the information, because if they're not aware of it, they can't make the transition first. They need the skills. And this is a major factor for many of the SMEs. They do not have the broad skill set that's needed to help them do this transition. The third thing is technology. While we talk a lot about the transition in very generic terms, we don't look at the fact that the technology that will be required to make this transition, especially in the area of climate smart agriculture and in the area of you know, the reforestation, all the issues that are going to come about in this just transition, technology will be needed. And then the fourth is finance. Who's going to pay for it? And a lot of the discussions, of course, on loss and damage, et cetera, are going to be about who pays and how do they pay. So I think those are the main elements that are important. So at the end of the day, capacity is the biggest need, the single biggest need for SMEs. How do we engage them in a way that allows them a seat at the table? Uh, they go from the rise of digital technologies that reshape what we trade and how we trade, uh, trade regionalization, fostering closer economic integration among its members, the reconfiguration of global supply chains, partly accelerated by COVID-19 disruptions, and greater concerns for sustainability in our world under the threat of climate change and environmental degradation. Given the time we have, let me just focus on the risk or further economic uh, fragmentation, because the price that we may pay for fragmentation is huge. Actually, estimates uh, from the WTO and the IMF point to potential losses ranging between five to 7% of global GDP. This is so that you can dim dimension it. This is like erasing the economy of India and Italy from the world. So from wherever you see, you see it, the cost uh, is huge. The fragmentation will also erode the international cooperation. Uh, we much need to address our global challenges. And let's be frank, this will have huge impl uh, implications, especially for the developing world. And this is because when national security and geopolitical considerations move to the center of, of the trade policy, multilateralism and the development agenda take a toll. We all know that. Developing countries risk being caught in the crossfire uh, of trade disputes or face growing pressure to take sides in, emo in economic conflicts. Nobody will, bring, uh, will win from it, but most especially some, especially the developing worlds, uh, world, will lose more than others. We are all aware that the world needs more resources to recover from the cascading crisis that we have all analyzed and assessed, accelerate the pace towards the achieving of the SDGs and fight climate change. But fragmentation results in less resources and in less cooperation. So we would be moving in the wrong direction if we don't take this into account. Mm -hmm.